Hello and welcome to Atop the Fourth Wall, where bad comics burn. At the 1983 San Diego Comic-Con, Mark Evanier, Bob Greenberger, Jerry Conway, Len Wayne, Bill Tossler, and Bill Warren got together and decided to do a little experiment. They would create a limited series, 12 issues, and each issue would feature a different creative team, different writer and artist for each one. None of the teams could talk to each other, they'd be allowed to use any character that DC owned, provided it was one they weren't currently working on, but they had to somehow create a coherent narrative for those 12 issues. And just to really screw with them, each issue had to end with a cliffhanger that the next writer had to resolve. As you can guess, this round-robin style of storytelling has potential for greatness and intrigue, but also the potential to be an hilarious mess. I first heard about the series a few years ago, and I've been eager to finally take a look. Infamously, a bunch of the people who worked on it shrugged off the mandate to build a narrative, and instead just took full advantage of being able to play with any character that DC owned. This came out in 1985 to 1986, during the same time Crisis on Infinite Earths was happening. Meaning that this was basically the last hurrah for a lot of these characters, many of whom hadn't been seen in decades and may never be seen again. So it's understandable why some creators just decided to have fun with the whole thing. The question, though, is whether or not they'd actually succeed in the challenge, and whether the audience could guess what was going to happen, particularly with the cliffhangers. With something like this, I might have been more inclined to review the whole thing at once to try to make sense of it, but we just came off a of Star Wars prequels month, and I think it's okay if we just look at this one issue at a time, rather than trying to cram it all in at once. So let's dig into DC Challenge number one, and see what this kind of freedom brings about for a story. The cover's okay, a little bland, featuring Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, and... I don't know, Steve Rogers or somebody, racing to confront a group of villains. The Riddler is the only one I recognize right off the bat, but I'm sure we'll find out more once we get into the issue proper. There's also that big question mark in the background depicting part of New York, as well as a car, which I'm sure will be essential to the whole mystery. Can you solve it before we do? Because I've gotta say, we're kinda stumped here and could use some help. We open with some guy entering an elevator. You know how it is some days. You wake up thinking you're going to read fortunes in exchange for necklaces, then you end up fighting a war on a beach a few hours later. The guy is trying to find the lobby button, which is apparently harder than it looks despite the elevator only having three buttons with the bottom one reading lobby. This guy, Floyd Perkins, is a copy boy at the Daily Planet and has gotten lost. Also, either the elevator lights are so bad right now that there's a big shadow over the rest of the buttons, or the Daily Planet is only three stories tall. Anyway, yeah, despite hitting the lobby button, he's been deposited on another floor. Instead of just waiting in the elevator and assuming that someone called it to this floor, he starts looking around. Around. And then he hears them. The voices. Floyd Perkins is actually a Twitch Plays Pokemon protagonist. He goes to investigate the voices in the next room, but trips on a plant or something. He finds himself in a room full of guys around a table, all wearing weird yellow and purple jumpsuits. Young man, leave this room at once! You have no right to be here! Yeah, a common thing heard by interns. Frustrated by how they're being so aggressive with him, Floyd suddenly realizes that one of their numbers is in a blue jumpsuit. Also, he looks like an alien. Holy! Is this a Star Trek convention? Actually, judging by this guy, I'm pretty sure it's an Outer Limits one. The alien tells him to leave or he'll be severely dealt with, 
So Floyd heads back to the elevator. There, he's met by a guy in a trench coat. You got a light? B -b -b bogart Terry, you've really let yourself go! So, yeah, Humphrey Bogart. Who knew he was a DC character this whole time? Well, ain't got no fruit on my head, so I'm not Carmen Miranda. Yeah, but if we painted your trench coat red, you could be Carmen San Diego. We cut to three miles away and our title page, where Superman is encountering some sort of creature emerging from a dude's back due to pink smoke. Too much pink energy is dangerous. Also, Supes, what the hell's going on with your legs there? Were you doing a ballet twirl in the middle of the air? Some sort of demon rising from his body. And decidedly unfriendly! Based on what? Dude's just floating there. Superman starts grappling with the demon, who decided to emerge from that guy wearing only a loincloth. Let me go, Superman! It is inevitable! What must be done, will be done! Even you cannot change that! I guess he's unfriendly because he's kind of vague about what he's saying. Also because he doesn't have any nipples. Jimmy Olsen is watching from the crowd. That guy can't be stronger. Oh yeah, get a whiff of his breath. And appearing right next to Jimmy is Groucho Marx. Come on, Groucho is dead. And I guess after eight years, it's okay to use his likeness. What the hell? You don't look so good yourself, kid. Tell the truth, are those freckles or liver spots? Don't stand there with your mouth open. Folks will mistake you for Howard Cosell. Let's enjoy the fight. Excuse me, sir, but I did a flawless Howard Cosell when Superman fought Muhammad Ali. Which is why the fight ended with them beating you up instead. Also, Linkara didn't catch on that that was the impression I was doing. I can see how flawless an impression it was then. The demon starts punching Superman back hard. He insists he'll only hurt those he has to. But yeah, Superman is almost out cold. Superman, do you hear me? What? You can stop this demon. Lower the air pressure around him. Groucho Marx, is that you? Superman recovers and flies in circles around the demon, creating a vacuum that lowers the air pressure around it, much like he'd do again in What's So Funny About Truth, Justice, and the American Way. However, instead of just sucking all the air out like in that, the vacuum apparently sucks the demon back into the guy he emerged from. So basically what I'm hearing is that this demon could have been defeated with a vacuum cleaner. While he carries the unconscious guy off, and Jimmy Olsen calls in to report what he saw, and for some reason decides to include the Groucho Marx detail, assuming that the guy is somehow alive, and wasn't just somebody doing an impression. Perry White doesn't buy it, even offhandedly remarking, Next you'll be telling me Humphrey Bogart's alive and well! I've solved the mystery, DC Challenge! Perry White has the power to summon dead celebrities! Floyd apparently overheard that, but no time for that now. Apparently Metropolis' hospitals were full or something, since Superman took the unconscious guy all the way to Gotham Memorial Hospital. They put him in an iron lung to help keep the demon contained for the moment and found the guy's ID. His name is James Hoyt. Supes decides his next step is to find out more about Hoyt. Which Clark Kent can do with a visit to Commissioner Gordon. I mean... I'd say Superman was flying over Gotham at the time and just noticed it, but the caption said it was only three miles away from the Daily Planet, and unless we're living in Batman v Superman world, Metropolis and Gotham are not traditionally right across the river from each other. Anyway, Gordon tells Clark Kent that Hoyt was a small-time burglar, but the weird thing is that he died in 1967, trying to steal his own life back. He's moving up to the big leagues. We cut over to stately Wayne Manor, where Bruce is informed by Alfred that they got a tape in the mail. Well, put it on! At least they sent beta, not VHS. Bruce threw a big party in 2016 when they officially declared VHS dead. Vindication, Alfred! Vindication! What the hell do you even care for, Bruce? You're rich, you can afford both. Maybe it's one of those movies, sir. I don't know, Alfred. I kind of like Wes Anderson movies. I've never seen one. Porn was more of a VHS thing anyway. Dirty, stinking VHS. I heard they had rock and roll music videos on them, too. They insert the tape. Actually, that's a thought. Has anyone ever done a parody of The Ring, but it's on beta, so nobody ever watches it? Um, anyway, the actual person on the tape is the Riddler. Hello, Batman. Or should I say, Bruce Wayne? This tape is rated R for Riddle! 15 in the UK! The Riddler, and he's figured out your Batman! Ghastly! He's going to team up with a childhood friend of yours who likes to wrap himself up in bandages and quote Aristotle! Why hasn't anyone patroned me to do Hush yet? Erm, um, anyway, the riddle is, why are the Dark Ages called the Dark Ages? Alfred says it's because so much knowledge was lost during the period. Not really accurate, but hey, I'll grant them that's general pop knowledge kind of thing. But Bruce has already slipped away to change into Batman and has an alternate theory. The Dark Ages were called the Dark Ages 
Because they had so many knights! Why isn't the Riddler called the Punster? As such, he figures it refers to the Gotham Museum of Knighthood and swings over to it while... Yeesh, first Superman? Now what the hell's going on with Batman in this panel? Putting on a little junk in the trunk there, Bruce. Once inside, he finds a crook named Lenny Horton who was hired to steal a stone tablet that dates back to 1200 AD. Batman offers to let him return the tablet and only get a breaking and entering charge, but Lenny's out on parole, so he'll get the book thrown at him if he's caught. As such, he grabs a flail from a suit of armor and attacks Batman with it. Batman, of course, easily deals with him. Okay, Lenny, tell me about the Riddler. What about the Riddler? I don't know nothing. The guy who hired me, his name's Strange. Damn you, Doctor Strange! We've got enough interdimensional crap happening with the crisis, and now you want to cross over? Actually, he says he was hired by Adam Strange, an equally bizarre turn of events. Can't remember if I've ever mentioned him before, but Adam Strange is a DC cosmic character, an archaeologist who's periodically transported from Earth to the planet Ran to aid in defending that world. Nearby, Batman notices another message left by the Riddler. Congratulations! You may have already caught the Riddler! Lady Horton is the Riddler? To claim your prize, figure out what kind of vegetation gives you a charge. Then take a calculated risk. Crazy. Helicopter. Meanwhile, Superman flies up to the JLA satellite to investigate what happened with the demon. Hope Aquaman won't mind me stopping in during his turn of duty and using the JLA computer. Considering at this point in JLA history, the satellite was so wrecked that it would end up crashing to Earth twice, and Aquaman was down in Detroit leading a crappy version of the team, he probably won't mind. No, he won't mind it at all. He isn't here. That's not like him. To leave the satellite unattended? Not like him at all. Clearly Mark Evanier was leaving hints and ideas for other writers to follow up on should they desire. But the problem is, I'm a nerd, so I'm just sitting here going, Yeah, because he's in Detroit, soups! Accessing the computer and cross-referencing the unusual activity, he sees that there's actually been a pattern of this throughout history. Creatures suddenly emerging from the bodies of otherwise normal people, believed to be associated with the phases of the moon. As such, he flies to the moon, where he no doubt finds an elevator he left there from his fight with Nuclear Man next to a crooked flagpole. Actually, he spots some kind of alien object inside a crater. Examining it, he determines that it's a relay device, receiving signals and sending them back to Earth. Wait a second. Aliens, the dead rising. I have indeed solved it before DC did. It's plan nine from outer space. Uh oh, someone behind me. I can hear his sound traveling even across the little Earth atmosphere I'm exhaling. Of course! Don't you know anything about science? Superman turns to confront whoever it is, exclaiming shock as his face melts into a weird lumpy potato. We don't find out who it is, only that a red ray of energy shoots him. Superman had earlier commented that the device ran on solar power, its cells having been charged with red sun radiation, so it's likely that's what's hitting him here. He collapses as the figure walks off. Over to the Daily Planet, Floyd is telling Jimmy Olsen about his encounter with Bogart, trying to go back to that weird floor of the building, but only finding a travel agency when they attempt to return. Jimmy believes him, but they can't really do anything about it without evidence. They head back down to their offices, where they spot Adam Strange talking with Perry White, trying to get in touch with Superman. He apparently decided to swap out his cool spacesuit for a trench coat, which just ends up making him look like John Constantine, frankly. He tells Perry that he needs to warn Superman about the stone tablet that Batman had stopped Horton from stealing. Probably would have helped if you had contacted the League or like any other superhero instead of just hiring a dude to steal it at him. We cut over to Washington, D.C. At the time, Diana worked with Steve Trevor in military intelligence, and they're informed that a small nuclear device has been stolen. They don't know how or when it was taken, but it's in the hands of unknown parties, and if it's hooked up to a power source, then, well... Boom. Wendy meets with the scientists who created it. One of them, Dr. Fisher, develops a headache as he talks with her about it. But Diana knows it's something else. I recognize the symptoms. Queen Apolita taught us about possession. It has happened before on Paradise Island. In the DC Universe, the Exorcist ended with Wonder Woman wrapping the lasso of truth around Reagan McNeil and beating up Pazuzu. There were no sequels. And indeed, another demon emerges from his back, though this one looks a little more demonic. Something about the thing's hair is evoking devil horns without actually having them. It attacks Wendy, saying it's come to fulfill a greater destiny, and that he was dead before. Maybe, but he's still got a job at a nuclear research lab. It's hard for the dead to find work. 
The demon tosses her through a wall and flies off. She tries to pursue in the invisible plane, this is pre-crisis, so she couldn't fly on her own yet, but loses it. Over to Gotham Penitentiary. Batman had earlier commented that it was odd that the Riddler would be doing this since he thought he was still behind bars, and indeed he's come to try to examine the Riddler's cell, but the guard on duty says he hasn't escaped and is still in there. As such, Batman goes to talk to him and asks him the riddle about vegetation that gives a charge. The Riddler refuses to help. Real sloppy, Riddler. If you don't know the answer, just admit it. And yeah, this works. Revealing the answer to be a power plant. Riddle me this. When is a donkey like the Riddler? Answer? When it's a dumbass. Batman heads to the Gotham power plant and he wonders who could have made the tape, since obviously the real Riddler would have been more boastful if he was truly behind it. Inside, the place is run on automatic when there should be a full crew working it. Instead, Batman finds a single figure, the same kind of pointy-eared alien as we saw before, but now wearing a turban for some reason. Batman demands to know what the deal is with all this, but the alien just points to a set of numbers written on the wall. Okay, what do the numbers mean? It doesn't matter. We're all going to die in a nuclear blast! Well, why the hell did you point out the numbers? What good are they to me then? The alien informs him that within his videotape recorder back at Wayne Manor, the stolen nuclear device has been placed. Oh no! Data! When the timer reaches the specified moment, it'll go off and be strong enough to take half of Gotham with it. He says that he's jamming radio channels so he can't call for help, and all the phones in the power plant are dead. And so our comic ends with Batman demanding to know when the thing is gonna go off. Relax, Batman. You have plenty of time. Almost eight seconds. Puh, no problem. As the Batman, I have prepared for every possible contingency, and as such, I... Oh, crap. Time's up. This comic is okay, but yeesh, the artwork is rough. I'm not sure what happened here, since the art team on it is Gene Colan and Bob Smith, yet there's a very rushed feeling to a lot of it. Backgrounds seem kind of sparse, facial expressions seem a bit goofy in places, and some of the superhero action leads to some weird poses. Still, I'll give it credit for having a lot of dynamic angles to shots to try to help keep it from being boring. It's just the finished product needed a lot more polish. The writing is just okay, since it's mostly there for setup, laying down plot threads that other writers can pick up on and run with, from the dead people returning to the demons, to the number codes, to the aliens, to the stone tablet. Just plenty of angles for future writers on the series to do something with. However, since it's mostly there for setup, there aren't a lot of interesting things going on, aside from discovering that Batman preferred Beta to VHS. We'll pick up on the series again later, and I see us returning to it over and over. Next time, however, we're back to Patreon-sponsored reviews, and back to Sentai as we return to Zhu Rangers to close out the Green Ranger story. Got a light? B -b -b bogart This is a non-smoking building! Hello my friends, please be sure to like this video, subscribe, hit the bell, and share it with others. And if you get a chance, maybe check out my Patreon.